Let us pray in silence again. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, this last summer, most of you know, I became a parent. And as everyone who is a parent or knows kids knows full well, this is one of those big, life-changing experiences everyone tells you can't know what it's like until it actually happens, and frankly, it happened, and I think I've done a pretty good job of not preaching about it every single week. <laughs> because I've got to tell you, that is exactly where my mind is most of the time. I don't want to bore you. I don't want to be self-indulgent. However, today, I am lifting my self-imposed Zuzu story ban. My daughter's name is Zuzu. And I'll explain why later. Everyone wants to know why Zuzu. But I think there is something here for us with universal applicability. So um, here it is. If you're ready for it, this is Zuzu after her mother has shown her the onesie she's about to put on. And then Zuzu smells it. How's that for a modern testimony? Amen. Edwin Freeman. In my adult memory, I have never laughed so hard about anything. <laughs> Ever. I have never laughed that loud. When Zuzu laughs, she laughs with her whole body. She laughs with her fingers and her toes, with nothing held back, completely free of all inhibition. And of course, that doesn't just go for Zuzu. That goes for just about any child I have ever met. You parents know that this is true. Anyone who has spent a few solid hours with kids knows it's true. So long as they have some safe space, and there's not some other issue, the sound that you heard is an innately human sound. We are designed to make it. Now this is relevant to us. Of course, this morning, because once upon a time, all of us, every single person in this room, used to laugh like that. Once upon a time, there was a little baby Michael, there was a little baby Elizabeth, and there was a little baby you. And you laughed just like that. And I want you right now to picture yourself as a child. You can close your eyes if you want to. Picture yourself as a little child, and maybe you have direct memories of this, somewhere in a crib, looking up at the ceiling. Maybe it's just pictures that you've remembered, but I want you to picture yourself, that little baby version, laughing just like this. <laughs> Okay, that's you. <laughs> now, being reminded of this sound that comes from you is relevant because none of us laughs that way anymore. Before Zuzu came into my life, I used to think of myself as a fairly uninhibited person. I'm quick with a joke, I'm down for a fun time, I'm basically a really easygoing human, I thought. But of course, you listen to my laughter, side by side with my daughter's laughter, and anyone can hear how absolutely held back I am. How inhibited. 
The comparison is really um, a lot. Yeah, and I laugh freely. Now, maybe once in a blue moon, you, me, all of us have these like really deep belly laughs. <laughs> once at a time, it happens and it's great. The circumstances all align and it's healing and it's amazing when it happens, but none of us smell our clothes and laugh that way. And let me tell you, that is about a two on the Zuzu scale. That is not even her wound up at all. So we are inhibited, all of us, grown-ups, and of course that makes sense. Right now, Zuzu has all of her needs taken care of. Right now, Zuzu has never met anyone in her life who doesn't really love her or thinks she's great. So Zuzu laughs. Eventually, this won't be able to hold. Eventually, there will be uh, traumas. Physical, emotional, existential. And with every one of these traumas, we humans accumulate layers of non-laughter, layers of shielding, emotional blocks and barriers, or all sorts of stuff that we call adult personalities. And it's tawdry. <laughs> So we have these blocks, and these are the blocks that keep us from that instantaneous joy on tap, this obvious wellspring of giggly beauty wonder that is apparently something that is our birthright, that every human naturally has at some point. I won't play it again. I'll play it again a little bit later. Listening to this uh, sound of Zuzu, it revealed to me just how far I am from that natural joy. And at least for me, it's, I can see the shielding. I can see my distance from that, um, like that naturalness. And it reminds me of a term that a friend once told me. It comes from the field of public health. It's called the allostatic load. You ever heard of the allostatic load? Grant, I knew, would, maybe a few others. The allostatic load refers to wear and tear on the body. It's that accumulation um, as an individual is exposed to repeated or chronic stress. It represents the physiological consequences of chronic anxiety internalized over time. And it happens to individuals, it happens to churches, it happens to countries. But in individuals is how allostatic load talks. The term is interesting. It represents this concrete way of observing the public health impact on uh, different kinds of communities that suffer different kinds of things. Poorer communities that live in harsher environments with less access to healthy food or, or stable circumstances, people who suffer under increased fear and tension, these all uh, accumulate more stress a higher allostatic load. It takes longer for these communities to recover from sickness. They often have much shorter lifespans. But each of us carries this load in our own way. We call it the self, this stuff we carry. Sometimes people wear it in a really puffed up way. Some people are bowed down by it, but you can see it on every human I've trained my whole life to look at it, think about it in myself and others. Today, I'm going to ask each of you to look at that load inside your own body, maybe inside your own family or church system, but right here in this incarnation, this burden of stress that weighs us down, it keeps us from laughing. It keeps our imagination atrophied. How does that experience, you all know you've got it, how does it distort my vision of the world and corrupt my experience of joy and freedom in it? Today's reading from the book of John is one of my very favorite readings. This scene that Kath read, it actually takes place after Palm Sunday. It's sort of out of order because John is structured differently than the other Gospels. There's a lot more stuff to cover in between Palm Sunday and Easter than we could ever fit in in our own uh, Holy Week. So we're kind of doing things out of order. But help me 
in picturing this scene in your mind. And let this picturing be part of our worship experience here today. A little Lectio Divina. And if you'd like, you can close your eyes even as we describe this scene. But really, whatever you do, let your imagination run wild into this scene for a moment. Project yourself into that place, into that room, as if you were one of Jesus' disciples yourself. So first of all, it's night. The only light in the room is from little lamps and wall niches and scattered across large tables. The lamps sit between dirty, empty dishes, cups of wine now sitting silent. Everyone around you is listening intently to what the teacher Jesus is saying. We're watching the shadows and light dance across his face as the candles flicker. The room is filled with other friends and followers. People of all ages are crowded around you, crouching, kneeling, standing, filling up every space as we listen carefully to the teacher's words. Some people have said he's the Messiah, the King who would come to restore Israel. Others point out that he certainly entered Jerusalem like a king, with all the pomp and the circumstance. Others still say king doesn't hit the mark. Some say that he is a human incarnation of Yahweh, the logos of God, entering into time and space in a human body right here in Judea to speak the unspeakable in human form. Whatever else he was to everyone else, you knew him as a man who had often said to you that you could only enter into the mysteries of the kingdom when we became like children. And when he laughed, he laughed with his whole body. Earlier that night, this childlike God King had shocked the crowd. He'd washed everyone's feet like he was their servant. He wouldn't put up with the protests. You watched him do it. You waited until he washed your own feet, and you were embarrassed. Crowded, he moved on to the next person, and then the next. But that shock was nothing compared to what he was saying now in the dark. You realize that Jesus is now telling you the future. Just like he's reading the future from the pages of a book. Calmly, Jesus tells the room that later that night, he will be betrayed to the Romans by one of his students. He says that someone in this very room will conspire to hand him over. And after that, he says that all of his students will be scattered. That one of you will even deny ever knowing me You'll be so afraid. And as he says this, you put the pieces together in your mind. You remember all the things he said over time and you realized Jesus has always been telling us exactly how he's going to die all along. And now that moment is coming. You note how there is no judgment in Jesus' voice. No condemnation of the fact that we will all be scattered in the morning. His voice is flat and matter-of-fact. For Jesus, the point doesn't seem to be that he's trying to have us avoid any of this. He talks as if it's already happened. The point is, Jesus is telling you what to do after this happens. Or maybe because this happens. And as Jesus is talking, this crazy idea flashes through your mind in the dark. This idea that maybe now, in this moment, Jesus isn't talking about how he's going to die. Jesus is talking about how he's going to continue to live. Tuning in again, you hear Jesus say, you are to love one another. And this love and this love alone is how you will be known as my disciples. 
After I am gone, I will send a spirit of truth to live inside you. A spirit of truth to serve as both your advocate and your guide. And through this you will know I have not left you. I will live. And because I live, you will live. And one day you will know that I am in God. That you are in me. And that I am in you. And then before you can take in the full impact of what Jesus has just said, someone asks a question. This is Judas, not Judas Icariot, the other guy. Judas says, Master, why do you make yourself plain to us and not the whole world? If Jesus is this big deal, why is it, what's happening in this moment? Is this the end? And from the look on Jesus' face, it seems like he knew Judas was going to ask that question, like he'd been waiting for it. And parenthetically, this is the moment in the other Gospels where Jesus offers the sacrament of communion. But here in John, the communion moment plays out differently. And the parallels are fascinating. In these final moments together, Jesus doesn't offer his disciples any clear messaging. There's no propaganda in this moment to take out through across the world. What Jesus says in Aramaic in the dark is something different, and I want you to hear it clearly. As if you were in that room right now, in the dark, feeling the temperature, smelling the smells, as if Jesus is talking directly to you. If you love me, you will keep my words and follow my example. If you love me, God will love you, and we will come to you, and we will make our home inside you. Okay, you can stop visualizing this scene for a moment. If we had time and this were a smaller circle, I would want to go around and hear what you felt and saw, each of you in your own way. This, a little taste of the spirit of truth speaking to you. And that would be a much better revelation than anything else I've got. But here it is. The spirit of truth. Because what Jesus offers us here in this moment is not dogma or ritual or formula. Jesus tells his disciples there is a kind of mystical union Where your body becomes his body becomes God's body. He reincarnates as all of us. And what I am left with as I read this is this feeling that the gospel maybe isn't what I was raised always being told what it was. And I've said it here before, but I'm going to say it again. I don't think that the gospel is some intellectual thing. I also don't think it's a metabolic thing. Instead, I think the gospel is a metabolic thing. It's an emotional thing. It's the exact opposite of that allostatic load. It's a kind of peace you can only experience in your body. Ideas don't count. Tradition doesn't count. We know this because Jesus said this over and over and over again. And it is something that can pass from person to person. And when it passes, there might be words that get used. And with those words, ideas that get spread. But neither the words nor the ideas are the thing. They are simply the carrier wave. The medium through which the spirit of truth passes between us. And we can feel it when it does. We know it when we Hear it. Jesus says that all of us have this spirit inside us, a spirit of love that he said would define us as disciples. But I believe that Jesus wasn't giving his students something new in that moment. He was uncovering something that had always been there from the very beginning, something that you can still hear 
and the voice of the kids who get up here and speak at the mic. In the voice of every baby, something that is still our birthright, and everyone knows where to look. So surprise, surprise. I have a baby, and I think it's a total miracle. But the big revelation for me is, the big life lesson from Zuzu is just how common that miracle actually is. How all-pervasive and how normal it is. It's the recognition that we have always lived inside a miraculous and hilarious universe. Always. And this is part of why I believe that Jesus really is still alive. And it's not a metaphor. That Jesus is alive and that maybe he is still reading the moments of our future here today watching us as if we're in the pages of a far-flung book, and that he still speaks to us now, and it's real. We can hear it beneath our blocks and our barriers, underneath all of our emotional shielding, and just in case you forgot, I'm going to play it for you here again. If I can figure it out. She's not choking. (laughs) What is the spirit of truth saying inside you? We can do a lot of things. We can do anything we want. We can organize the church different. We can organize this or that plan. We can have great ideas. We can sing great songs. But that spirit of truth is everything. And if you, like I, can feel your distance from that, it's an agony. That is the distance. But it still speaks to us. You know where it does. And today I ask you to ask yourself, what does that spirit still want from you? How does that spirit want to live inside your body? It's never too late. Amen.